So I want to um, provide a lot of the history background and context for the uh, Ukraine war. But first, let's start with the Iraq war, uh, because I appreciate that some of you may have been born after the Iraq war, but it was a major event. And um, this is a picture of uh, George W. Bush, who, along with Tony Blair, um, occupied and invaded Iraq in a completely unjustified way. It was based on a tissue of lies, which we knew were lies at the time. Iraq was a defenseless country, and they pretended it was a powerful country with weapons of mass destruction. It was really not really George W. Bush, but there were a clique of neoconservative, neocons, we call them, ideologues who felt that uh, America was the most powerful country in the world and can do whatever it liked. So Bush and Blair are clearly war criminals. Julian Assange was one of the people who um, exposed the war crimes that they committed. He's in prison, but Bush and Blair are invited to speak at many events. So he spoke at this event and he actually was going to criticize Putin. So he said, the decision of one man to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq, I mean of Ukraine, Iraq too. And at this point, the audience started laughing, um, whether it was embarrassed laughter or whatever it was, we don't know. Um, however, it's, uh, it's called here on MSNBC or it was uh, this May, in May of this year, that he made that speech. Um, and uh, it was called a Freudian slip, where you say something you don't mean, you don't mean to say, but it exposes what you really think. Of course, Iraq was an unprovoked and absolutely brutal war. The very, the very first day we saw on TV uh, a huge number of bombings and missiles, shock and awe it was called. But, uh, well, there you go. And the interesting thing, the particularly interesting thing is that he says, it doesn't just say Iraq, I mean Ukraine, and stop there. Uh, he says Iraq, I mean Ukraine, and Iraq too. But he was responsible for Iraq, so it's quite a bizarre um, turn, of turn of phrase. Anyway, I've taken this slide from uh, a Swiss uh, website called uh, Cyper. It's in the bottom right-hand corner. So they're trying to uh, express the uh, the top five arms companies in the world so they appropriately provide that as a grenade graphics and you could see the number one and this is dated um, January 2017 so the number one um, arms manufacturer in the world is Lockheed Martin 45 billion US dollars um, they use Milladen which I think is German for billion the number two company is also a US company Boeing Number three company is also a, a US company, Raytheon. Interesting that num the fourth uh, largest company, arms company, is a British company, BAE Systems. And you may remember that Tony Blair, that war criminal, um, blocked an investigation into bribery by BA Systems to try to sell their arms uh, to a large country in the Middle East. Uh, the fifth largest company is also a US company, Northrop Grumman. And it's absolutely clear that war makes a lot of money for certain companies. OK, here's another slide from the, 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 the same uh, Swiss uh, Institute for Peace and Energy Research. And this is based on figures in uh, 2018. And it shows expenditure or military expenditure uh, by different countries, by the top countries so number one no surprise the biggest rifle goes to the usa and in 2018 it spent 649 billion uh, that year on military expenditure now there's a big difference between the usa and the others in the top 10 and in fact if you do the calculations which i've done on the little table on the right you could see that um, it spends almost three times as much as the, the second place, which is China. Um, and uh, then there's a whole bunch of countries which are very close together, Saudi, India, France, Russia. So Russia doesn't spend a huge amount, uh, as much as, as you would have thought, on their military. Uh, the surprising figure, of course, is India, a country of wealth, but also huge poverty. Uh, China, of course, has a large economy, so not a surprise that it spends a huge amount 
on military expenditure as well. Then after those come uh, a clutch of other countries, Britain, Germany, Japan, and a bit further down, South Korea. So the US spends as much as China, Saudi, India, France, Russia, in Britain, and Ger more than those eight, the next uh, seven countries up to up to Germany, and it spends just about as much as the the top the se the 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 number two to number eight countries added together. That's a huge amount of money which is spent on armaments, and you consider that the United States doesn't even have a national health service. Uh, it's uh, rather bizarre their sense of priorities. Mm -hmm. Okay, illegal wars. Uh, this is uh, a slide I've taken from uh, Daniel Ganser. He wrote a book uh, um, about uh, Nazi war criminals that were employed by the US um, Secret Service and MI5 as stay, stay behind troops in parts of uh, Western Europe. So Italy uh, and uh, Turkey and France and, uh, and uh, other countries, Spain and so on. Uh, they were they were Nazi ex Nazis who were kept secret and employed by the CIA, um, and then they carried out um, uh, bombings and blamed them on communists and socialists and so on. Uh, the most famous example was uh, in Italy, and it was called Gladio. The secret uh, the code word for the, for it was Gladio. So they've all basically been called Gladio. But anyway, here he's talking about illegal wars um, between 1999 and. 2022. So we can see in uh, 99 um, countries like USA, Canada, Britain, Germany, etc., uh, were involved in the Serbian uh, bombing. Uh, in 2001, of course, uh, there was the uh, the bomb, the illegal war on Afghanistan. 2003, the war on Iraq. 2014, you've got the USA, France, and Britain in Syria. Uh, 2018, you've, he's also got uh, Israeli bombardment of Syria, but actually Israel bombs Syria and occupied Palestine uh, quite regularly. 2015, he's got the Saudi Arabia attack on Yemen. It's quite a number of illegal wars. Uh, and 2011, of course, the attack on Libya. Okay, here we have uh, American interventions, either coups or attacks on or bombings on various countries. So the interesting one to start off with there is Iran. I'm just going to add a marker. I think I can get a point as a pen. Okay, so here we have, uh, I think you can see the cursor now. Um, 1953, uh, there was a, a government, Mossadegh government in Iran, that wanted to use the oil in Iran for the benefit of the Iranian people, which seems like a crazy idea. Uh, and Britain actually, uh, it was a, the Anglo, Anglo Persian oil company, later called the Anglo Iranian oil company, later called BP, uh, that was getting all the benefit from Iran's oil. Um, so he nationalized it. And then there was a coup carried out by Kermit Roosevelt, and he got rid of Mossadegh and installed the Shah of Iran in power, and uh, oil continued to be stolen as before. And it didn't end there, because if you look across to 1954, Kermit Roosevelt, who sort of now was the expert in coups, went over to Guatemala and carried out a coup there. And there have been a number of coups which, which we can see. I mean, in the, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, sort of the American continent, You've got uh, the attack on Cuba in 61, you've got Nicaragua in 81, Panama 89, they attacked General Noriega, who used to be a CIA asset, then Grenada in 83, Chile, nine, uh, you know, um, the uh, 1973 attack on Chile, which again got rid of a, uh, an elected uh, president, replaced him with Pinochet, the dictator. And then you've got uh, some, some we've already mentioned, there was a bombing in 98 of Sudan, um, and 2001 Afghanistan, also bombings of, of Pakistan as well, 1950, the Korean War, 64, the Vietnam War, 70, the secret war in Laos, 69, also secret war on, on Cambodia, uh, 65, there was uh, uh, the Indonesian coup, 
So there have been a huge number of interventions and uh, he's also got 2014 Ukraine, which you may be intrigued to learn about. Maybe uh, later on in the slides we'll see some more details about what happened in 2014. Okay, let's look at drone killings. Now, drone killings are supposedly killing evil people, but of course the reality is completely different, as we found out. Daniel Hale was the whistleblower this time, and uh, he admitted that, or he, he made, he exposed for the first time the fact that the CIA knew that 90% of the victims of drone killings were innocent civilians. Now that's bad enough, but um, what's even worse is that many of them are actually children. So if you look at uh, the drone killings in Somalia, in total there were 965 killings. And this is up to March 2019, so there have been more killings since then. Uh, but up to March 2019, the US had killed 965 people in Somalia, of which 11 were children. It killed, uh, yes, the US's drone bombing in Yemen, it's killed over a thousand people, of which more than 44 were children. In Afghanistan, between 2015 and 2018, it killed almost 4,000 people, of which 37 were children. And in Pakistan, it killed two and a half thousand people, of which more than 172 were children. Killing 172 children, that's... Um, and here we have something like 250 odd children killed in those four countries by the US. That's a huge number of children's deaths. In the year of 2016, you can compare that uh, the countries that uh, Russia and the US uh, bombed. The, on the left is uh, Russian bombing in Syria, and uh, there were quite a lot of bombings in Syria, quite a lot of uh, uh, bombing raids in Syria. However, on the right you can see uh, American bombings, and they include bombings in Iraq, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Afghanistan, Libya, and Syria as well. So a lot of interventions going on. And it's also interesting to look at the number of uh, countries uh, and the number of so US soldiers that there are based in other countries around the world. And the size of the soldier uh, shows you uh, is a uh, corresponds to the number of soldiers. So you can see the biggest soldiers here correspond to the something like 40,000 soldiers, US soldiers based in Japan. Uh, 34,000 based in Germany, um, a large number, 23,000 odd based in Korea. Uh, this is uh, January 2017, so at that time there were 10,000 in Afghanistan as well, so now those have scrambled away. Uh, but there are, so, there are US soldiers in Bahrain, Kuwait, still in Iraq, uh, in Italy, in Spain, and in, the, in Britain as well, 8,000 or so. Okay, there are about 700, or there were at the time of this slide, 700 US military bases in 42 different countries. Those are the ones colored blue. Um, and of course, there are over 4,000 US military bases in the US as well. So a huge number of countries, most of South America, most of the countries in South America have uh, US military bases. Um, a lot of countries in, in Middle East and North Africa have, have US military bases. That's just a huge number of military bases around the world. And actually the figure may be closer to 800 now. So let's, let's compare it with other countries. Top left, you have uh, the number of military bases that France has. It has been military bases in 11 countries, uh, quite a few in uh, Africa. And here at top right, we have the number of uh, countries that uh, Britain has military bases in. And again, it's 11 countries it has military bases. So let's compare it with uh, two evil countries. First is Russia, and it has military bases in nine countries. Most of these are actually um, neighboring countries to Russia, which were once part of the USSR. Um, then there's Syria here and Vietnam as well here, which has close links to Russia. Number of military bases in foreign countries that China has is limited to one uh, in its Djibouti. And actually, uh, if it's here, you may not be able to see it on the slide, but it's here, Djibouti. 
And actually, in fact, other countries have military bases in Djibouti as well. So, for instance, Britain has a military base in Djibouti, and so does France, and I think Brit uh, US has as well. Okay, we often hear these days about how NATO is a defensive alliance. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. A lot of things happened out of the Second World War. In 1945, the UN was founded. And in 1949, the, uh, the organization known as NATO was founded. And in opposition to NATO, the Warsaw F Pact was put together by the USSR, so the countries that it had under its control in Eastern Europe. And that was in 1955. And um, let's look at some, uh, but even, but irrespective of that, you can see that many countries were bombed and attacked or or had a coup organized against them throughout the years. 1953, Iran, 54, Guatemala, um, Egypt in 56, Cuba in 61, Vietnam attacked in 64, Nicaragua in 81, Serbia in 99, Afghanistan 2001, Iraq 2003, Libya 2011, Syria 2011. Since then, they've been continuing. Uh, Ukraine, start, things kicked off in 2014, Yemen in 2015. In the meantime, we had the founding of the International Court and we had, oops, one, um, actually, let me, let me go back to this. And uh, whether NATO is a defensive alliance is actually open to question because it has been involved in many bombings and attacks around the world. And these are just some of the countries uh, that, that were involved. Okay, two other things I want to talk about. Um, in 1972, the ABM Treaty was signed between the uh, USA and USSR. It's an anti-ballistic missile treaty, so it, dis it deters a first strike. In other words, the idea of nuclear weapons was that uh, if the US launches nuclear weapons at Russia or uh, the United USSR, then the USSR will launch nuclear weapons at the US. So although the US will destroy the USSR, the USSR will also destroy the US. So there's no point in actually launching nuclear weapons at your enemy. However, if you create an anti-ballistic missile which can shoot down your opponent's nuclear weapons, then you can actually send your nuclear weapons off, destroy their country, and when they are, try are trying to destroy your country, you shoot down their nuclear weapons and then you don't get destroyed. So anti-ballistic missiles are very, very dangerous idea because they can lead you to think that you can survive a nuclear war. You hit them first and you shoot down their nuclear weapons. In 2002, George W. Bush withdrew from that treaty. 1987, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, INF Treaty, was signed between, again, the US and the USSR. So this was a brilliant treaty because it removed, destroyed about 900 and uh, US nuclear intermediate weapons and 1900 Russian nuclear intermediate weapons. And this, this was because um, now you, you had short range or l rather than the, inter uh, the intercontinental ballistic missiles, which we were talking about before, you had short range nuclear weapons and they were, they were um, kept in Europe. They are also very dangerous because the flight time from the America to Moscow is quite a long time, maybe half an hour or something with a missile. So if the Russians see something that looks strange, like it might be a nuclear attack being launched by the US, they've got half an hour to check, oh no, it's just a flock of birds, or no, it's a civilian airline, or no, it's something else. <clears throat> so, so you have plenty of time to not press your button mistakenly thinking it's a nuclear weapon and you are under nuclear attack. However, with these intermediate nuclear weapons, they're much closer, they're in Europe, so the flight time is minutes. So the Russians, seeing this object coming towards them, don't have that much time to decide, oh, it's not really a nuclear weapon, I don't need to press that, push that <coughs> button. So this was a really great t treaty because it removed thousands of missiles from Europe. In 2019, Trump withdrew from those, uh, from that treaty, and the U.S. had broken its terms. Perhaps the Russians had also pushed through, you know, some of its terms as well. But those things could have been sorted out. 
Withdrawing from these treaties, which makes every human being safer on Earth, is an absolute disaster because it leads you much closer to nuclear annihilation, even by accident. And that's not something that's theoretical. These things have happened um, in, I think, 80, in, in the 1980s, the Americans and NATO were performing a military exercise which involved testing their command and control structure for nuclear weapons. The Russians actually thought that it was a nuclear attack on them. Um, but luckily they realized it wasn't in time. We were very, very close to nuclear annihilation. These treaties make us safer and withdrawing from them is, is very bad news. Okay, <clears throat> now I want to turn to Ukraine and a little bit of history. And I, I, I want to start this far back for a particular reason. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with someone called Simon Petliura. Now, he was a, a, a Ukrainian independence leader from 1917 to 1920. He fought against the Bolsheviks who had taken power in Russia. <clears throat> he fought against the Bolsheviks. He also massacred Jews. And uh, so there's a picture of, of him uh, on the left and there's a picture of him on the right, which is a picture actually of a statue of him. And you can see the similarities between the photo on the left and the statue that they created uh, more recently. And it was a new statue created in 2017. Now, Hannah Arendt, uh, who was a, a Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany, who went to America, uh, she was quite a famous sort of philosopher. Um, she also uh, reported on the Eichmann trial in Israel. A uh, very uh, interesting report. She compared uh, Simon Petliura to the Nazis. And he Petliura was actually assassinated by a Jewish poet, Sholem Schwarzbard. Now, the left-hand picture I took from a site called, as you can read in the bottom right-hand corner there, of the photo, Stormfront. And that's a very right-wing neo-Nazi site. I think it's based in the United States. And the picture, a photo I've taken uh, from the left is from a newspaper from Israel. It's called The Times of Israel. Uh, okay, let's carry on. So, Petli Ura was before the Holodomor. And let's talk about that now. So that was in 1932, Stalin's Holodomor Holocaust, where uh, now people argue, different historians argue about the number of Ukrainians who were starved to death. But the generally accepted figure amongst serious historians is four million. So four million starved to death, that's a, that's a huge number. And uh, many Uk Ukrainians blamed, blamed those deaths on both Russians and Jews. Um, Stalin was, of course, the leader. He wasn't actually Russian. He was Georgian, of course. Um, Molotov was instrumental. Pavel Postyshev was also instrumental. Molotov, he's the guy who the Molotov cocktail is named after. Lazar Kaganovich and Genrich Yagoda were also quite heavily involved uh, in, in the Holodomor. Um, those two were um, uh, Jewish. Uh, Kaganovich was a friend of Stalin, very senior and uh, Yagoda was head of the secret police at that time. So this is a, the, uh, again a picture from the Jerusalem Post, which is again an Israeli newspaper, and it's uh, describing uh, far-right protesters in Ukraine. And, it, and in the headline it says they demand Israel apologizes for communism, which is a bit ridiculous. Um, but the subheading is a little bit more factual. It says the far-right activists have called on Jews to assume responsibility specifically for the Holodomor, a famine that killed millions of Ukrainians in the 1930s. And the reason they did that was because some of the Jewish people, some of the uh, people that they have blamed, and I think they had a, a court case uh, in Ukraine a few years ago, and they blamed specific people for that uh, genocide. Okay, so and now we come to Stefan Bandera. Um, and the reason I, I mentioned Petliura was because he was before Bandera and he was before the Holodomor as well. I mean, you could argue in some ways that uh, Ukrainians suffered a genocide and then that made them very angry against the Soviet Union and then they sided with the Nazis and perhaps that's some sort of justification. But uh, Stefan Bandera was a fascist leader of the org Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. And um, this is a torch-lit march commemorating him. 
he was at times a Nazi ally. So he was a pre-World War II terrorist, or he's regarded as a terrorist in Poland. He welcomed Hitler. He collaborated with Nazis, and that included the murder of Jews. He declared independence and was then arrested by the Germans. And then his uh, Ukrainian insurgent army collaborated with the Nazis again. Then it fought them. Then it collaborated with them. So uh, it went backwards and forwards a bit. So they massacred Poles and other non-Ukrainians. Then they continued to fight against the Soviets until 1947, uh, working with the CIA. So after the Second World War, um, he was a UK and US anti-Soviet intelligence asset. So this is where this sort of uh, idea of Nazi collaboration goes back to Stefan Bandera. Now, in the inset, I've got a map of Ukraine, which is highlighted in yellow here. And recently, there have been a lot of statues put up of Bandera. And uh, this obviously dismayed a lot of people who fought against the Nazis, because here is someone who collaborated with the Nazis and, and statues of him are being set up. But you notice that this map of where the statues are being set up, they're all in the west of Ukraine, which is this area here. Now, there is one other statue which is actually an anti-Bandera statue, and it's called Shot in the Back. So it describes how uh, Bandera's people, his army, uh, shot uh, the Soviet soldiers who were fighting against the Nazis. And that is, of course, um, uh, cited in the Crimea, which has a huge, I think, 90, over 90% ethnic Russian population. We'll come back to that a bit later. OK, it wasn't just uh, Stefan Bandera who collaborated with the, with the Nazis. There was actually an SS Galician division, for, again from the west of Ukraine, 14th Waffen SS Galician division. And um, you can see their, their insignia is this sort of uh, lion. And here on the left is a clip that's actually on the internet, uh, a historical clip of um, uh, soldiers from this uh, division going off to train. Uh, with the Nazis and you can see they're carrying the the uh, flags with the swastika and they've also got this flag on here and you can see this this um, on the building here you've got this uh, shield so um, now particularly in the west of Ukraine they wanted their independence and on the one side you had Stalin on the other side you had Hitler so they obviously regarded as uh, Hitler as the lesser of two evils because they blamed the Holodomor the genocide on Stalin Okay, now what I want to address uh, is uh, this idea that uh, at the fall of the Soviet Union in about 1991, um, the Americans promised the Russians promised the Russians that NATO would not expand an inch to the east. And recently, there's been some pushback against that idea. People saying that it was that was never mentioned. Um, so here, I've gone to the U.S. Uh, archive, uh, the National Security Archive, and uh, here it has the memorandum of conversation between Mikhail Gorbachev and James Baker in Moscow. So Gorbachev was the uh, U leader of the USSR who basically um, came up with, the, uh, with perestroika and dissolved the Soviet Union in effect. And James Baker was, I, th I believe, the Secretary of State. So here on the left is the actual memorandum of understanding. So I'll just read it out. We understand the need for assurances to the countries in the East, referring to Eastern European countries such as Russia. If we maintain a presence in Germany that is part that is a part of NATO. So we're talking here about the unification of reunification of Germany. West Germany was under US control and influence. East Germany was under Soviet control and influence. Then they were reunited. So, there would be no extension of NATO's jurisdiction for forces of NATO one inch to the east. So the phrase one inch to the east is actually in the, in the memorandum of conversation. And the description here on the right uh, is dated, uh, so the date of this is um, February 9th, 1990. And the description is, even with unjustified redactions by US classification officers, so this is on the internet and some parts of it have been um, redacted or uh, blocked out, edited by US 
uh, senses. This American transcript of perhaps the most famous US assurance to the Soviets on NATO expansion confirms the Soviet transcript of the same conversation. Repeating what Bush said at the Malta summit in December 1989, Baker tells Gorbachev, the president have, and I have made clear that we seek no unilateral advantage in this process of inevitable German unification. The Soviets, remember, until this point, had their soldiers and tanks in East Germany. So they were withdrawing them, and they were promised that NATO would not expand one inch to the east. Okay, now uh, this is uh, the front, pay, uh, front piece of a book by, called The Back Channel by uh, William J. Burns, Bill Burns. And he was U.S. ambassador to Russia. And he's currently, actually, and he retired under Trump because Trump seemed to have no need for diplomacy. Uh, that's why he's called it The Back Channel, because this is what diplomats do. They have a back channel to other countries that maybe you have problems with. Um, so he's a strong believer in using diplomacy. For Biden, he came out of retirement and Biden appointed him CIA director. Now, I've taken these photos from that book and you can see in the top photo uh, that he's sitting in the middle and here is Barack Obama. And on this on this side is uh, having a cup of tea is um, Putin. And here we have another photo. We have on the left Putin and his uh, foreign minister Lavrov. And on the right, we have William Burns. So he was he was U.S. ambassador. Apparently, he speaks fluent Russian. Uh, he was also ambassador previously to, I think, Jordan and speaks Arabic as well. Um, so why am I talking about William Burns? Because I've taken these four clips from his book. So the first one. Earlier that year, I had stressed in another cable. So he's talking about sending cables back to Washington. Uh, from Russia, he's the US ambassador there, that nowhere is Putin's determination to stop the erosion of Russia's influence greater than his own neighborhood. Georgia was the proximate concern, but Ukraine remained the reddest of red lines for Putin. The Orange Revolution in 2004 was a massive blow for the Kremlin, and so on. The second quote, Putin offered little resistance to Baltic membership, Again, these are all countries that were part of the USSR sphere of influence before members of the Warsaw, Warsaw Pact, the opposite of NATO. Putin offered little resistance to Baltic membership, membership of NATO, that is, amid all the other preoccupations of his first term. Georgia, and especially Ukraine, were different animals altogether. There could be no doubt that Putin would fight back hard against any steps in the direction of NATO membership for either state. Uh, and the third clip, I, again, I've mentioned the ABM treaty. So um, he, the, 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 the phrase he uses is uh, Putin obviously swallowed the US abrogation of the anti-ballistic ABM treaty early in the Bush administration, but resented it deeply. So it's a worrying situation for Putin as leader of Russia. And the last clip I've got is um, especially to Ukraine. Ukrainian entry into NATO is the brightest of all red lines for the Russian elite, not just Putin. In more than two and a half years of conversations with key Russian players, from knuckle-draggers in the dark recesses of the Kremlin to Putin's sharpest liberal critics, I have yet to find anyone who views Ukraine in NATO as anything other than a direct challenge to Russian interests. Okay, now let's turn to WikiLeaks. I mentioned uh, Julian Assange being um, imprisoned, whereas war criminals like uh, Bush and Blair, whose war crimes were exposed by WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. So let's look at WikiLeaks. This cable was actually secret, and um, it's a famous cable, and it's called Niet means Niet, and Niet is the Russian for no. So no means no, Russia's NATO enlargement red lines. And it's from... The U.S. ambassador Bill Burns, who we've just uh, we've just met, and um, it's to um, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State in the United States, and also to NATO. And this is a confidential uh, cable. Um, okay, so what does it say? Uh, classified by Ambassador William J. Burns. This is uh, he was ambassador to Russia between 2005 and 2008. Summary. 
Uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, he's still the Foreign Minister, by the way, and other senior officials have reiterated strong opposition, stressing that Russia would view further eastward expansion as a potential military threat. NATO enlargement, particularly to Ukraine, remains an emotional and neuralgic issue for Russia. But neuralgic means uh, extremely painful in your uh, in your facial nerves. Uh, remains an emotional and neuralgic issue for Russia, but strategic policy considerations also underlie strong opposition to NATO membership for Ukraine and Georgia. In Ukraine, these include fears that the issue could potentially split the country in two, leading to violence, or even, some claim, civil war, which would force Russia to decide whether to intervene. So this was... Um, when was it? Uh, 2008. So it's it's uh, incredible. He's actually predicted what has happened now in 2022. Okay, so no extension to NATO, one inch to the east. Let's look at actually what happened. So uh, the original uh, members of NATO are these blue con- dark blue countries here. And then uh, very shortly later in 52, Turkey was added and then, and then Greece. And then 55, uh, West Germany was added here. So West Germany and East Germany were separated at that point. And then uh, Spain was added in 1982. Again, that's not really uh, of that much interest. Then you had 1990, the German reunification. But then what's happened since then, since that one inch, no, not one inch to the east? Well, you've had these countries, Poland, um, and uh, and Poland's getting very close to Russia now. And then you've also had uh, all the Baltic states as well. Um, and uh, Albania, Croatia. So you could see this, this country here is, uh, is Russia. This is Bel- Belarus. And this is Ukraine. So adding Ukraine to NATO is a lot more than not one inch to the east, apart from, you know, Poland and Hungary and Czechoslovakia and so on. It's another promise that the Americans have broken. And it's interesting if we stop to consider how many treaties the Americans have broken. I talked about the two uh, anti, the, uh, uh, anti-ballistic missile treaty, the INF treaty, nuclear intermediate nuclear forces treaty. Um, we've talked about this promise of not one inch to the east. I mean, even um, they made an agreement with Iran, which they, uh, which Trump pulled out of. Okay, uh, this is a talk given by George Friedman. Friedman. And uh, he founded uh, Stratfor, which is a private intelligence uh, agency, and he's a security analyst. So again, nothing surprising here. He, he, I'm quoting him here uh, in this speech. Again, it's on the internet, and you can jump to, if you find it, it's on at the 42 minutes into his speech. For Russia, the status of Ukraine is an existential threat. Russians must have at least a neutral Ukraine. And there's quite an interesting quote he has here on the right. Um, where he says the primordial interest of the U.S. over which we fought wars, the First World War, the Second World War, the Cold Wars, has been the relationship between Germany and Russia, because united they are the only force that could threaten us. Threaten us means the threaten the United States, and to make sure that that doesn't happen. There's an old, uh, there's a quite a joke from a British uh, diplomat about what is NATO, and NATO is to um, uh, to keep the Germans down the US in and the Russians out, um, but it's expressing more or less the same thing. Okay, now I want to turn to a report from the RAND Corporation, and this was produced in the year 2019. So the RAND is a sort of uh, American military government think tank, um, and uh, this is to do with overextending and unbalancing Russia, assessing, assessing the impact of cost-imposing options. So here's, here's a table from the report. Um, so on the left, they've got uh, economic cost-imposing options. And then they look at how, first of all, how, likely, how successful they would be in extending Russia, what, whether the benefits are high, low or medium, and whether the costs to the United States are high, low or medium. So interestingly here, if you look at the second row, which says impose deeper trade and financial sanctions. So the likelihood of success in extending Russia, in other words, damaging Russia, is high. So that's a good thing. 
So the benefits to the US are high, that's a good thing, but the costs and the risks are high as well. And this one is increased Europe's ability to import, uh, import LNG, liquid natural gas, from sources other than Russia. So the likelihood of success in, uh, in hitting Russia is moderate, but the benefits are high and the costs and risks are high. So understanding these tables will give you an understanding of what's happening now with the sanctions against Russia. And here's, I've, I've picked up another table from that same report. So again, geopolitical cost imposing options, there's a list of them down here on the left. And again, the same sort of thing, the likelihood of success in extending Russia, the benefits, uh, in terms of how much damage you can do to Russia and the costs and risks to the United States of those actions. So the first row is provide lethal aid to Ukraine. So success in extending Russia is moderate. The benefits are high, but the costs and risks are high as well. And there are a few other things as well here. Uh, but interesting that these things are being looked at by uh, these sort of military think tanks. Okay. So this is from the NATO North Atlantic Treaty Organization website, and this is the Bucharest Summit Declaration from 2008. And this is issued by the heads of state and governments that participated in the meetings of NATO in Bucharest in, 20, in 2008. So there are a different number of paragraphs, and paragraph 23 is, NATO welcomes Ukraine's and Georgia's Euro-Atlantic aspirations for membership in NATO. We agree today that these countries will become members of NATO. Now, apparently, uh, well, not apparently, this was actually opposed by France and Germany. And it's said that Britain also opposed it, but didn't want to say anything because they didn't want to upset the Americans. Uh, Britain, of course, being America's uh, lapdog again. And this was in 2008 when President George W. Bush was uh, US president. So despite the fact that France, Germany and probably Britain were opposed to it, how did it get chosen uh, to be part of uh, NATO's summit declarations? Because the United States dominates NATO. What the US states happens in NATO. OK, let's let's look at Ukraine now. And uh, you can see this is a map of Ukraine. And uh, on the, on the, so here on the west, you've got this large band of red, which is mostly Ukrainian speaking people. Here we've got Crimea. And look at that. That's ethnic Russian majority in virtually the whole of Crimea. Then on the east side, you have significant ethnic Russian populations. So you can see immediately that there is a split between western and northern Ukraine and eastern and southern Ukraine in terms of ethnicity and linguistics. Okay, this slide I've got from the Washington Post, which is an American newspaper, and it, uh, it pictures the 2004 election results. So here on the left, you've got the pro-EU votes. So you can see here that they voted uh, in these percentages. Most of them are like 60 or 70 odd percent for Viktor Yushchenko, who's the pro-EU person. And if you look at, remember where those Stefan Bandera statues were, you can look at the percentages here. This is like 92%, 94%, 93%. Now, on the east and the south, you've got those who voted for Viktor Yanukovych. And if you look at Crimea, it's like 82%. Uh, actually, down here, there's a small bit, which is 89% for him. But they're all uh, eastern and southern. They're, vote they're voting for a more pro-Russian candidate. So you can see that there's a split, again, based on the previous uh, map I showed. Now, again, this is the Washington Post, and this time it's the election from 2010. And again, you see exactly the same thing. You see in yellow the, 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 uh, the areas that voted for uh, Timoshenko, and you see on the right the, the areas that voted Yanukovych. So no surprise that there is this east-west, north-south split, almost half-half. Right, then we come to 2004. So what happened in 2004 what's, is called an orange revolution, and, and it's part of these so-called colour revolutions. Um, so Yanukovych, who was the pro-Russian side, if you, if you want to think of it in, that, in those terms, uh, apparently won the election. People came out in the streets, and uh, then it was decided that the election would be rerun, 
And Yanukovych was kicked out, and Yushchenko, his opponent, was kicked, was brought in, the pro-EU side. Now, this is from The Guardian, obviously, and I've just picked out this paragraph here. But while the gains of the orange-bedecked chestnut revolution, I think most people call it the orange revolution, are Ukraine's, the campaign is an American creation, a sophisticated and brilliantly conceived exercise in Western branding and mass marketing that, in four countries in four years, is part of the colour revolutions that he's talking about, has been used to try to salvage rigged elections and topple unsavoury regimes. Of course, the de definition of an unsavoury regime is one that's not a US lapdog. Now, in 2010, there was a flip. The guy who lost the election... Uh, was brought in, and uh, so Yanukovych, I mean, these names can be a little bit difficult. So Yanukovych is the pro-Russian guy. He came in, he previously lost in 2004. Oh, he previously won and then was kicked out in 2004, won and lost in the same year. And now he came in in 2010, and Yushchenko, who'd won in 2004, was kicked out. And the, this often happens in the Ukraine. Whoever wins gets kicked out because they don't like the austerity. Uh, so six years of austerity and there was a change. And observers, this again is from The Guardian, and it says Yanukovych set to become president as observers say the Ukraine election was fair. And here you, you, uh, you've highlighted in yellow, international observers this afternoon held yesterday's poll as fair and truly competitive. Observers from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, OSCE said that there were no indications of serious fraud and described the vote as an impressive display of democracy. So, 2010 was elections were fair and truly competitive and an impressive display of democracy. Okay, so then what happened at the end of 2013 and uh, tw beginning of 2014? So Yanukovych, who I've previously I described in this slide as a pro-Russian uh, candidate, um, is actually not really fair to describe him as pro-Russian. He was more uh, he was more neutral rather than pro-Russian because he was because he came from the east of Ukraine, and he pushed for joining the EU. He managed to take along those pro-Russian areas into uh, joining the EU. However, the EU didn't offer him membership. They offered him an association agreement. An association agreement is not, was not, he was not being, Ukraine was not being offered membership of the EU. He was being offered an association agreement. Now, Putin, as we know, did not, or Russia, did not want uh, Ukraine to move towards the West. So they, naturally, Russia used its influence. So uh, Yanukovych had a, a stark choice, as this clip, again, this is from Al Jazeera. Either receive gas sub subsidies and loans from Russia, or work on expensive reforms now in the hope of future benefits from Uni European integration and trade. So Yanukovych, Yanukovych and other Ukrainian leaders ant anticipated that the initial investment costs for U EU membership would be high. Anyway, Ukraine blames the EU for not offering sufficient financial compensation to cover economic losses from Russian blockades or to offset the high cost of gas imports. It's interesting the terms they use, expensive reforms now. What they mean in terms of its expensive reforms is what you need to keep in mind uh, as we turn to the second clip from this article. Despite a looming economic and financial crunch, the Ukrainian government is reluctant to implement fiscal and monetary, refor monetary reforms proposed by the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, because they are deeply unpopular and would hurt the president's uncertain re-election chances. Okay, so again, the EU wanted fiscal and monetary re uh, reforms. In other words, austerity on the one side. And then Russia would punish Ukraine if it tried to join the EU by um, by removing the gas subsidies, so the cheap gas and loans from Russia. So Yanukovych, although he had tried to persuade the Eastern Ukrainians to go for an EU membership, he was faced with a bad choice. Uh, EU membership would not gain a huge amount in monetary terms, and Russia was offering a better deal. So he rejected the EU pact. Now, that caused people in West Ukraine uh, to start protesting. So you can see in the photo here, 
the tents and the flags. So, uh, like the two thousand, like the Orange Revolution in two thousand and four, in this happened now in two thousand and thirteen. Uh, they went, started a, uh, in in a place called the the Maidan. They set up tents and started protesting. Maidan's interesting because that's uh, obviously an Urdu word and an Arabic word as well. Uh, so it's gone into the Ukrainian language as well. But that's an aside. Okay, back to the U.S. and back to neocons. Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, Victoria Newland. She admitted in this meeting, and again, this is on the internet. Actually, you can uh, you can go and find it. Uh, and I've put uh, uh, the uh, closed captions on, and you can see what she's saying in, in white at the bottom there. So she said, we've invested over five billion to assist Ukraine in these and other goals. This was in 13th December 2013. She was flying between Ukraine and America, and she was speaking at the US-Ukraine Foundation Conference. So who is Victoria Newland? She, her husband is Robert Kagan, another one of these neocons. He was the co-founder of the Project for a New American Century, PNAC, which targeted Iraq, Libya, Syria, Yemen. So these were the people who took control with George W. Bush, the neocons, and pushed him to invade and, and bomb. They wanted him to bomb Iraq first and then Syria and then a whole bunch of other countries. In fact, surprisingly enough, most of those countries were um, uh, old pro-USSR Soviet Union uh, states. So you can see what's happening. They're, the Americans are gobbling up the East uh, European countries that used to be members of the Warsaw Pact. They're targeting uh, countries that were friendly with the Soviet Union in the past as well. Um, and it's, of course, it's pure coincidence that these are countries that Israel wants to bomb as well. Um, the neocons were big supporters of Israel. So what is this? Why, why is the US invest investing $5 billion in Ukraine? She admits it herself. Okay, here's some photos from uh, various newspapers, and uh, the one on the right is The Guardian. And uh, the photo on the left, let's start with that. So, here you have um, Senator John McCain. Uh, he's a Republican and uh, consistent warmonger, always wants to bomb various countries. Um, next to him, you've got a Democrat, um, Chris Murphy. And then here, you've got a Ukrainian politician. He's the, one of the opposition leaders. And uh, this is uh, at the time of Maidan. So the, some of the Ukrainians in the West, uh, Kiev is towards the west of Ukraine, uh, are protesting. And uh, this guy, Ole Tianibok, uh, is one of the leaders of the Maidan protests. Now, he's actually a leader of the Svoboda Party or Freedom Party. It's a far-right neo-Nazi party. And in the 2012 election, it basically got 10% of the votes. Um, in Lviv, which is, again, that region uh, in, in the west of Ukraine, he actually received 38% of the votes. The votes uh, a couple of years later dropped down to 4.7% because as soon as people realise what these neo-Nazis are like, their support tends to drop. But anyway, uh, here on the right, uh, we've got the Guardian headline, which says, John McCain tells Ukraine protesters, these are the protesters in Maidan, we are here to support your just cause. And uh, he's meeting with this uh, extreme right-wing party with links to the BNP. Imagine if the BNP in a general election in the UK got 10% of the vote, or even you know 38% in some town or something. It would be shock, horror. And uh, the, the insignia of uh, Svoboda is very reminiscent of these Nazi symbols and they've changed it recently to try and make it uh, more friendly but he i mean you don't have just one photograph of john mccain and this american senator Dem democrat as well so no democrat and republican both sides come along to uh, ukraine and uh, support the the removal of this uh, government which remember was fairly and freely elected so you have another photo of him here you have a photo of him meeting with this guy um U.S. Senator John McCain dined with the opposition leaders this weekend, including the extreme far-right Svoboda Party. So again, uh, the Russians have said that there's a bunch of neo-Nazis in Ukraine, and the reaction has been, no, no, they're talking rubbish. Actually, they're not. There is this uh, link to the far-right. We hear a lot about the Maidan protest, and we don't really hear that there was actually an anti-Maidan protest here. So on the left, I've got a picture of the anti-Maidan protest. You can see a fair number of people here going off into the distance. And on the right is the Maidan protest. 
So now here we have Victoria Newland again, that neocon, and next to her is Geoffrey Pyatt, who was the US ambassador. And she's handing out cookies to uh, the protesters in the, in Medan. You know, there is no doubt that these people wanted closer links with the EU and, and wanted uh, a better financial future. future. What perhaps they didn't realize was that the EU in their association agreement was going to demand, you know, austerity and fiscal reforms that it's debatable would ever would leave them off uh, better off in the short term, certainly. OK, so here's an interview with Ina Kirsch, uh, who's uh, German or Austrian, and uh, she uh, was a supporter of uh, Ukraine. Uh, and she's saying that uh, people finance revolution. Soros also supported the Maidan, paid people there. They earned more in two weeks on the Maidan than in four weeks of work in Western Ukraine. That doesn't mean, however, that the Maidan was bought as a whole. The outrage after the non-signing of the association agreement was, of course, genuine. But one shouldn't delude oneself. There is enough evidence that people were paid both at the Maidan and at the counter-event, the anti-Maidan. Um, I know people... So she's actually reporting. I know people who cashed in on the anti-Maidan at the counter demo in the morning, then went over to the Maidan and cashed in again there. OK, now, isn't that so familiar? Uh, I mentioned the coup in Iran in 1953. Kermit Roosevelt, who is a CIA guy, he funded both pro-Mossadduk and anti-Mossadduk demos. It's a playbook that goes back right to the beginning of their coups, 1953. OK, here's uh, more people and, again, more photos. You've got Klitschko, you've got Victoria Newland and uh, Jeffrey Pyatt, the ambassador, US ambassador, the neocon. And you've got Yats. Uh, you need to remember these names. And here's another photo, uh, Victoria Newland again, the neocon. Here's that right-wing guy, Tan Yanni Bok. And there's Klitsch, Klitschko, uh, or Klitsch, as he's sometimes called. And this is Yatsenik, which is uh, all the same guy here, Yats. OK, let's see. Right. Now, there's a very interesting thing. Um, now, I've mentioned those names because there was a phone call Victor between Victoria Newland, the neocon, and the ambassador, Pyatt. And this was secretly recorded, presumably by some intelligence service, probably the Russian intelligence service. And this conversation was then released. So uh, I've taken some clips uh, from the whole conversation. Again, it's on the Internet. You can actually go and listen to it. And uh, Pyatt says, I think we're in play. The Klitschko piece is obviously the compli complicated electron here, especially the announcement of him as deputy prime minister. And you've seen some of my notes on the troubles in the marriage right now. Newland says, good, I don't think Klitsch should go into the government. OK, Victoria Newland is a US diplomat, secretary, assistant secretary of state. She's talking to the US ambassador to Ukraine and they are deciding amongst themselves who should be what in the government of the Ukraine? I mean, it's just crazy. What have they got to do with the government of Ukraine? So, Klitschko thinks he's going to be, or he's been announced as Deputy Prime Minister, but Newland says, no, he, Klitsch, as she calls him, should not go into the government. Then Pyatt says, the problem is going to be Tianibok. You remember that right-wing extremist? Newland breaks in. I think Yats is the guy. What he needs is Klitsch and Tianibok on the outside. The Pyatt says, do you want us to set up a call with him as the next step? But I think just knowing the dynamic that's been with them, where Klitschko has been the top dog, so I think you're reaching out directly to him helps with the personality management among the three. Newland replies, that would be great. I think to help glue this thing and to have the UN help glue it, and you know, F the EU. Actually, this conversation is famous for that phrase because um, the Germans got extremely upset by the obscenity and the, the language use. But basically... She is deciding who is going to be in the Ukraine government. And we're talking about a protest to get rid of the government. So she's deciding who is going to be the leader of the next government in Ukraine. And she's discussing it with the US ambassador. So let me work on Klitschko. We want to try to get somebody with an international personality to come out here and help to midwife this thing. So they want someone to help convince those people what to do. And Newland says, um, you need US VP uh, Vice President Joe Biden, so he was Vice President then, and I said probably tomorrow for an attaboy and to get the deets details to stick. Look at that. 
the government hasn't a, a government that was freely and fairly elected without fraud is being overturned and the US two US diplomats are deciding who's going to be the next leader and isn't this so similar to the removal of Imran Khan as a Pakistani leader where the US was discussing uh, US were officials were discussing amongst themselves about a vote of confidence in Pakistan in the in the parliament before it was even tabled similarly here they're discussing about who who they want to be leader who are they going to arrange to be leader by persuasion or whatever before the Ukrainian government has even fallen okay so we talked about the Medan demonstration now some of the buildings were held by the government but some of the buildings were occupied by Medan protesters and one of the buildings that was occupied by the Medan protesters was the conservatory you can see it in the background here and again this is from a news night BBC Newsnight program uh, where this guy on the right uh, the BBC presenter is interviewing a, a photographer Eugenie Malalektko and he actually wandered into that building with his camera and um, Okay, let me let me get, let's go back to a time timeline of what happened. So the demonstration started in Maidan at uh, the end of 2013. There was a bit of violence, but nothing too bad. Um, and then on 20th February, snipers fired on the police and on the demonstrators. Demonstrators. Now, Newsnight have pretty much uh, established that the firing, the snipers came, and the firing came from that building, the conservatory which was not held by the government, but was held by Maidan supporters. So on the 21st, so the 20th February, you had the snipers firing. The 21st, 21st February, the government and opposition agreed an EU deal, so the EU was an intermediary. There would be an interim government and early elections. And then on the 22nd of uh, February, uh, the, uh, Yanukovych had to flee and opponents seized power. Okay, so what do you call it when there's a shooting and uh, an elected, uh, democratically elected government is uh, removed from power? It, it's a coup, and it was a coup organized by the Americans. And here you have Victoria Newland on the left, Pyatt, the US ambassador, uh, next to her, and on the right you have Poroshenko. And guess what? Who is the prime minister? Yats is the prime minister, just as v Newland wanted. Who is not in government? Klitschko is not in government. He later became mayor of Kiev, just as Newland wanted. Tan E. Bok, the leader of Savada, not in the government. And, you know, they were talking about making him, there was announcement of him being deputy. And at the Victorian Union didn't want it, so he's not in the government. But Svoboda take vice prime minister of economic affairs. So this is the far right party with links to the BNP, the British National Party here, the, na the neo Nazis here, and neo Nazis in Ukraine. Svoboda take the Minister of Defence post. Svoboda take the Minister of Agriculture post. Svoboda take the Minister of Environment post. Right sector, which is more extreme than Svoboda, take Minister of Education. And Andrew Parubi, who was the co-founder of Svoboda and was the commandant at Maidan, so the one in charge of that building becomes secretary of security and national defense on on the Nas and the national defense committee so the idea that there's no neo nazi or no right wing or no nazi influence in ukraine is completely false although in terms of numbers they perhaps didn't have huge numbers in terms of influence in the events in maidan and in the subsequent government they had a strong influence and of course, that immediately caused uprisings in the eastern part of Ukraine. So these people were protesting in Donbass, the region on the east, and basically civil war started. So they took over their uh, government offices. Uh, the Ukrainian government said to them, disarm or face a full-scale anti-terrorist campaign. And so they sent the 25th Airborne Brigade, but the, that brigade switched allegiance and it handed the militia six amphibious tracked infantry armed uh, fighting vehicles and then a Ukrainian military co column uh, uh, civilians came out and talked them into disarming so basically persuaded the soldiers not to fight the rebels so um, that was quite critical because the the Ukrainian government realized that they couldn't trust the military really because a lot of military were sympathetic to the rebels 
And this is why uh, they started to turn to these militias. Odessa again is on the south coast. So there was, again, like the anti-Maidan protest, uh, there was a protest set up in Odessa against the, the coup, as they called it, in Ukraine. And they were attacked by right sector, which again I mentioned as uh, uh, as being quite a right-wing neo-Nazi group. And their football thugs, there was a football match and they, they marched to the people where they were protesting, to their tents. They, the, the protesters, the anti-government protesters now, uh, took refuge in this uh, building, and then the uh, the right sec these thugs set fire to the building, and 50 of them uh, were killed in the fire. Uh, this is a picture from Reuters. So um, this is the Guardian from uh, 2014, uh, talking about Azov fighters are Ukraine's greatest weapon and maybe its greatest threat. So. Because the government uh, found that parts of the military um, were sympathetic to the uh, to the uprising in the eastern part of Ukraine, the Donbas, uh, they relied on these far right volunteers, and the most famous of them are is the Azov Brigade, and so basically the rebels took a town called Mariupol, which is on the coast. Um, and the Azov reputation, reputation, because they, they call them, here the Guardian calls them Ukraine's greatest weapon, it's grotesque over, uh, exaggeration, but they got a reputation because they went into Mariupol and retook it and fought off the rebels and kicked them out. And that became their uh, centre. So now in this article I've picked out uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of parts. So today they, they did, people in the, in the West, the media, deny that the Azov have anything to do with far right or neo Nazis or Nazis. But in 2014, they weren't shy. Here's this article in The Guardian, and uh, there's an embedded reporter in The Guardian who's writing this, and he's, uh, he's with the Azov Brigade. So he's interviewing someone called Dimitri. Dimitri claimed not to be a Nazi, but waxed lyrical about Adolf Hitler as a military leader and believes the Holocaust never happened. Not everyone in the Azov Battalion thinks like Dimitri, but after speaking with dozens of its fighters and embedding on several missions during the past week in and around the strategic port of Mariupol, the Guardian found many of them to have disturbing political views and almost all to be intent on bringing the fight to Kiev when the war in the East is over. And later down, uh, there's another paragraph which I've picked out, and uh, this is the response from one of the fighters. Of course not. It's all made up. There are just a lot of people who are interested in Nordic mythology, said one fighter when asked if there were neo-Nazis in the battalion. When asked what his own political views were, however, he said, National Socialist. As for the swastika tattoos on at least one man seen at the Azov base, the swastika has nothing to do with the Nazis. It was an ancient sun symbol, he claimed. I don't, I don't think you could even make that up in a, in a comedy program. Okay, uh, there's a large Ukrainian community in Canada, and this is from a Cana Cana Esprit de Corps, which is a Canadian military magazine. And the, the article is entitled, Choosing Friends and Enemies in Ukraine is No Straightforward Task. So it's, uh, the bit I've picked out is, last week the US Congress voted to explicitly prohibit American soldiers from training the Ukrainian militia unit known as the Azov Battalion. The reason the American lawmakers gave is the fact that this rogue unit is openly rife with neo-Nazis in its ranks. So at one point it was not controversial to mention the fact that the Azov and other of these military uh, groupings were neo-Nazis. So, and pictures that, like this are all over the internet. You can see um, you have a NATO flag, you have a Nazi symbol, and this is the Azov flag. Remember the Savoboda uh, insignia? It looks like a na Nazi symbol. And here's one guy even giving a Nazi salute. So, who founded Azov? Azov was founded by Andrei Bilecki. He stated, the mission of Ukraine is to lead the white races of the world in a final crusade against Semite-led Untermenschen. And uh, here's how the, look at the symbol. So on the, this left-hand side, we have the symbol 
which is from the second panzer division ss das reich and they fought the red army and were responsible for massacres now this insignia is called the idea of the nation svoboda the national socialist party and they i've talked about how they were involved in the maidan and then they changed it to that and then the, here's the azov battalion and it was a regiment integrated into the army by the minister of the interior it's actually uh, to be quite strict is the national guard but anyway um it's it's difficult to uh come up with comparisons but it's as if the edl uh football thugs uh neo nazis or right wing extreme right wing were then incorporated into the british army uh it's just sort of unthinkable really Okay, uh this again is from the Times of Israel. Ukrainian Jewish billionaire sues Russia over Crimea airport dispute. Ukrainian nationalist Igor Kolomoisky. Kolomoisky is quite interesting because he was the one uh who funded uh the Azov battalion. Uh and he's uh, perhaps one of the richest men, perhaps the richest man in Ukraine. Um he's also I think has uh Israeli nationality as well. He was banned from the U- Kolomoisky was banned from the US because of corruption. Actually there's a lot of corruption in Ukraine. Um and uh you know corrupt people tend to like uh having military people that can enforce their decisions. So Kolomoisky is a notorious Zionist oligarch. He funds the Azov battalion or used to fund the Azov battalion until it got incorporated in, into the uh, National Guard. Um and, and that's only that's not the only right-wing neo-Nazi battalion that he funded. He also funded the neo-Nazi Adar battalion and he funded Zelensky. And Zelensky obviously is not a neo-Nazi. Zelensky is basically an actor and uh, um he played the president of Ukraine in a TV program. And uh it's a bit bizarre that he's then elected as president of Ukraine. Okay. Um so Zelensky or his office on Victory in Europe Day which is Victory in Europe against the Nazis day uh posted on his Telegram channel a picture of Ukrainian soldier and the insignia on his chest uh is blown up here on the right you can see it here and that's actually you, you look it up in Wikipedia which is where I got this from the 3rd SS Panzer Division Totenkopf uh was an elite division of the Waffen SS of Nazi Germany during World War 2 uh its name totenkopf is german for death's head the skull and crossbone si- symbol and it's it is thus sometimes referred to as death's head division and uh when that was pointed out it was quickly taken off but um it still remained on the left you have a posting from nato um on women's day and it says things like all women and girls must live free and equal and on the right you have the mfa of ukraine which is the ministry of foreign affairs and it's uh, saying that according to the latest survey more than 15% of the regular ukrainian army are women okay that sounds great except when you look in a bit more detail and you see some of the symbols that are uh, being used uh and they're a di- little bit difficult to see unless you zoom in uh but it came up even in newsweek newsweek which is a, a us magazine an official of the us led nato alliance was told has told newsweek that the coalition did not notice what appeared to be a symbol associated with nazism on the uniform of a ukrainian soldier featured in the since deleted photo on nato's official twitter account the image uh is basically the sun symbol and it's here as well on this side the black and i've taken this from wikipedia black sun symbol the black sun german schwarzer sun is a type of sun wheel employed in nazi germany and later by neo nazis okay we talked about the coup and uh, the next president was poroshenko uh, and that's a picture of perish poroshenko here again probably one of the richest men in ukraine uh, one of the oligarchs because there was a civil war between the west and the east of ukraine the government of ukraine and the rebels um and the the ukrainian army didn't do very well against the rebels so in t- 2014 there was what's called the minsk 1 agreement which was basically a ceasefire and the withdrawal of heavy weapons and that was backed up in the beginning of 2015 i think january with the minsk 2 agreement 
where the two regions of Donetsk and Luhansk were given a special special status, there was decentralization, and they were basically um, given a lot of, uh, supposed to have been given a lot of autonomy. Now we find that Poroshenko is saying that actually the Minsk deal was only used to buy time, and they never intended to actually fulfill the requirements of the Minsk agreement. Our goal was first to stop the threat, or at least to delay the war, to secure eight years to restore economic growth and create powerful armed forces. So he's mentioned this in two interviews. One was with uh, Germany's Deutsche Welle television and the other with the US-run Radio Free Europe. So what was this? 2014 to 22, eight years or really seven years of NATO training. How Ukraine... And this is... Um, from a, a EU observer uh, and it says how Ukraine is actually winning against Russia which is of course delusional but the interesting thing is since the 20 it says in the article since the 2014 crisis in Ukraine eight NATO members provided hands-on training for Ukrainian instructors through classes drills and exercises involving at least 10,000 troops annually for more than eight years so that's an, a total of 80,000 troops. NATO and its members helped the embattled country shift from rigid Soviet-style command structures to Western standards. So NATO has been training the Ukrainian army since 2014 or 2015. And again, back to NATO's uh, webpage. This is a press conference by NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, and that was 29th June 2022. And it says here that I've taken out two clips. Today, allies recommitted to the pledge we made in 2014 to spend at least 2% of GDP on defence. Since 2014, uh, so they're talking about... So this is great for NATO because <clears throat> uh, NATO is now... The NATO countries are now spending more money. <clears throat> and what are they spending money on? <clears throat> they spend money on arms. But NATO countries have to be able to slot and different armies, different countries' armies. So they have to have the same equipment, which is great for American arms manufacturers. And he says later on here, I understand that it's always easier to invest in health, in education and infrastructure instead of allocating money for defence. That's very easy to understand. That was the reason why NATO allies reduced defence spending after the end of the Cold War. But if we reduce defence spending when tensions are going down, we have to be able to increase defence spending when tensions are going up. So he wants increased defence spending. Now, this is the meeting with the heads of state and government with partners at the 2022 NATO summit. So the NATO Secretary General says, when the world is changing, NATO has to change. And when things happen fast, we need to react fast. And that's exactly what happened after the invasion on the 24th of February. We have actually prepared for this possibility for a long time. It's not as if NATO suddenly woke up on the 24th of February and realised that Russia was dangerous. The in their invasion was predicted very precisely by our intelligence. OK, let's go on further. He says, they and the reality is that we have also been preparing for this since 2014. Because that's the reason why we have increased our presence in the eastern part of the alliance. So... Here we've got the Secretary General of NATO admitting that they've been preparing for this from 2014. It's not just the 10,000 troops that have been trained every year. Okay, here's a, a page from OSC, which is the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. It's part of their special monitoring mission to Ukraine. It's a neutral organization. It has people from all sorts of different countries. And they provide uh, details of what's been going on. Now, you can see here uh, in this graph here uh, where it says ceasefire violations. And this border is the border of Ukraine. And this this is the Luhansk and Donetsk regions. And you can see this red line and yellow uh, are where the ceasefire violations are occurring. So on the west is western side in, in, in this region is the Ukrainian army. And on the, on the east and south is the, are the rebel regions. So this is from the UN Human Rights um, uh, document. And I've picked out this comment here, where Ukrainian forces are locked in a nearly eight-year conflict with Russia-backed separatists that has left more than 14,000 people dead. Now, 14,000 people dead in, since 2014. 
That's a lot of dead people in this conflict. So the war did not start in 2022, it started in 2014. And there's 14,000 dead people which provide evidence for that. Most of those dead are, of course, um, rebels uh, from those eastern regions. And um, and the 14,000, of course, includes uh, soldiers from the Ukrainian army, uh, soldiers from the rebels and civilians in that eastern region. And here's a table with um, a, a, a table of civilian casualties in just in 2018 to 2021. And you can see that the civilian casualties are 80, more than 80 percent in the t in the territory controlled by the self-proclaimed republics. And then uh, this is another graph uh, which shows the massive increase in shelling against the population of Donbass on February 16th. And this indicated to the Russians uh, at the beginning or in the middle of February that a major offensive against those uh, ethnic Russian, Russian speaking people in the Donbass region was imminent. And the author believes that this is what led Putin firstly to recognize the independence of those republics and then to consider an intervention under Article 51, which means coming to the defense of people who are being attacked. The interesting thing is that back in 2014, those regions asked Russia to recognize their independence. And Putin told them, no, you should stay in Ukraine and be part of Ukraine. OK, so... Uh, let me address whether this is a proxy war by the U.S. against the Russians. So here's Joe Biden, and uh, he went to poor, poor Poland, he went to Warsaw, and in, on his, in his speech he said, for God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. He's referring to Putin. Then we had um, the Secretary of State, uh, Blinken, and other officials walk back Biden remarks on Putin <coughs> ouster. The president said the Russian leader cannot remain in power, but the U.S. has clarified it is not pursuing regime change in Moscow. And this is end of March, March 27. And then March 28, Biden contradicts his aides and reaffirms his call for Putin's overthrow. And literally he says, I'm not walking anything back. And here's Hillary Clinton with an interview with MSNBC on the Rachel Maddow show. So Clinton said, Russians invaded Afghanistan. It didn't end well for the Russians. That is the model that people are looking toward. Russia has overwhelming force. We have to provide sufficient military armaments for the Ukraine military and volunteers. So um, Hillary Clinton has been in and around the corridors of power for a very long time. Um, I'm sure she's very well aware of what's going on. When she, I mean, she, this is a very, very interesting statement because it basically, it, it tells us everything we need to know about what was going to happen and what has happened since she said this. And it's absolutely correct. The model that the US is using is the model of Afghanistan. So let, encourage them to invade, support the opposition and the resistance and bleed Russia so that it, uh, the country fails. Um, and look at what she's saying. Uh, Russia has overwhelming force. She knows that Russia would defeat the Ukraine army and uh, the Ukrainian army is going to be defeated. But look at what she says. She still wants to provide sufficient military, ar military armaments for the Ukraine military and volunteers. So she's, she's expecting a resistance to rise up under Rus Russian occupation and that will bleed the Russians. So it's quite clear what um, she is imagining. She's imagining a long, protracted uh, fight which will bleed Russia and destroy Ukraine, just like Afghanistan was destroyed, but Russia was bled, or the Soviet Union, as it was then, was bled and collapsed. And here's the Wall Street Journal. U.S. wants to see Russia weakened, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin says after Ukraine visit. And uh, Austin says U.S. wants to, so it's uh, U.S. Def Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin wants to see Russia's military capabilities weakened. This is in, back in April 25th. Austin explicitly saying that the U.S. wants to see Russia's military capabilities weakened. So it's not about Ukraine. It's about striking Russia through Ukraine. Who's the U.S. Secretary of Defense? Here, here he is here. 
uh, he's in the foreground, and we've got Blinken, and then um, uh, who's Secretary of State, and then uh, someone else. Oh, oh that's uh, apparently Zelensky. Oh. Um, Lloyd Austin was CENTCON commander, but immediately after retiring, he joined the board of Raytheon Technologies. Remember Raytheon Technologies from one of my earlier slides, one of the biggest military companies in the world. As of October 2020, his Raytheon stock holdings were worth roughly $500,000, and his compensation, including stock, totaled $2.7 million. So you have a US Secretary of Defense who's deciding policy which is going to raise the stock of a company in which he has major shareholdings. War is always profitable profitable for some people and here's a very right-wing magazine the Atlantic America's hesitation is heartbreaking uh, by Elliot Cohen again one of these Bush era uh, Iraq war neocons the United States and its NATO allies are engaged in a proxy war with Russia they are supplying thousands of munitions and hopefully doing much else, sharing intelligence, for example, I think it's pretty certain that they are, with the intent of killing Russian soldiers. And he says, uh, to break the will of Russia and free Ukraine from conquest and subjugation, many Russian soldiers have to flee, surrender or die, and the more and faster, the better. That's typical neocon language. And here we have the New York Times, May 4th. U.S. intelligence is helping Ukraine kill Russian generals, officials say. So the clip is, uh, United States has provided intelligence about Russian units that has allowed Ukrainians to target and kill many of the Russian generals who have died in action in the Ukraine war, according to senior American officials. Ukrainian officials said that they have killed approximately 12 generals. Now, leave aside whether they have actually killed 12 generals or not. This is astonishing. At the height of the Cold War, when America and the USSR fought proxy wars around the world, they never actually admitted to fighting those proxy wars. This is astonishing that Americans are actually admitting to basically fighting a proxy war against Russia. It's very, very dangerous. Russia and America both have nuclear weapons. It's not something that should be taken lightly. Moskva sinking, which was a, a Russian flagship uh, in the uh, uh, in the in in the Black Sea, uh, U.S. gave intelligence that helped Ukraine sink Russian cruiser. Reports now it may be that uh, the U.S. did provide uh, Ukraine with the intelligence which led to the sinking of this Russian uh, missile cruiser. However, it does not make sense to claim that information. Even if the Americans know and the Russians know, it is still not right to actually go out there and tell people that this is what's been doing because that leads to a very dangerous situation. The US provided intelligence that helped Ukraine sink the Moskva, Russia's flagship Black Sea missile cruiser, several US media report. Unnamed officials said Ukraine had asked the U.S. about a ship sailing to the south of Odessa. The U.S. said it was the Moskva and helped confirm its location. Ukraine then struck it with two missiles. Again, whether this information is true or not is not the point. The point is that this is openly admitting that you are fighting against Russia. A nuclear power is very, very dangerous. And uh, with my last slide, I just want to finish with two pictures. Uh, which I think capture the situation we are in at the moment. And the first picture on the left um, is a picture of Archduke Franz Ferdinand uh, setting off for um, a very significant motor ride in Sarajevo. Um, his shooting and his death led to the First World War where millions died. Um, it seems to me that uh, we are in, with the expansion of NATO and uh, increased tensions with uh, large superpowers, we're in a very, very dangerous situation. The picture on the right uh, is a picture of uh, Cuba in 1962. It's actually the missile site where the Cuban missiles were um, deployed. And uh, again, we were very, very close to nuclear annihilation. Um, President Kennedy's, all of President Kennedy's advisers 
said that he should go in and bomb that site because they didn't think it was ready. Um, only one advisor said, no, we should go and find out what the Russians are actually, what they want to do, let's talk to the Russians. And that was the correct thing to do because um, the site was basically ready. And it's not commonly known or understood that actually the United States had installed uh, nuclear missiles pointed at Russia in Turkey. And uh, the missile, the Cuban Missile Crisis was resolved uh, by the Russians removing the missiles uh, it, from Cuba. And very quietly, a few months later, the Americans removed their missiles from Turkey pointed at Russia. So these situations are very, very dangerous. Uh, Nuclear-powered countries facing off to each other could lead to the extermination of um, the hum human beings, human life on this earth. And the only way you can move forward is by talking to the opposition and understanding their point of view, their perspective, and realizing that you know both sides are human beings. And unfortunately, uh, we have been propagandized so much about um, the Ukraine war and how we need to send more and more armaments and see more and more Ukrainians destroyed. Um, and really what we need and what organizations like Stop the War have been saying right from the beginning is that we need a diplomatic solution, we need peace talks, we need people to sit down and talk to each other and move away from this confrontation, confrontation and both sides have to make concessions to attain peace. Otherwise, one side will be totally destroyed and Ukraine, we're seeing that now. Ukraine is being slowly destroyed. Hundreds of people are being killed every day. Um, hundreds are being injured every day and for no good reason whatsoever. It's a pointless war. Uh, the arrogance of driving NATO further eastwards has created this situation and Americans themselves of intelligence and wisdom have warned that this was a crazy thing to do. I've talked about the former US ambassador, William William Burns, but even academics like uh, John Mearsheimer have, have predicted really what is happening now. Um, and uh, other economists, I think Jeffrey Sachs has uh, predicted, uh, has said that we need to be talking. Even, um, uh, even war criminals have said that we should be talking, Ukraine and Russia and America should be talking to resolve this problem. But um, still, um, we're seeing a terrible situation in Ukraine and really, it, you know, we need to bring peace to that region and remove tensions and remove weapons from that region so that um, countries and people in Europe can live their lives in peace. And uh, that same should be true around the world. Um, Thank you for listening.